If you would, turn your hymn books to number 299, Rescue the Perishing. We'll sing all four verses, 299. the ushers to come forward tonight as we receive the Lord's tithe, your offering. If you haven't given, you give. Ask God to bless it. Hey, it's, we support 37 missionary projects. You know, sometimes I stand amazed at how, how much the Lord has grown us, amen, over the last 28 years. I've had the privilege of being the pastor here 28 years and uh, working on 29. I always told Brother David Barentine this when brother, he was our founding pastor. And I told Brother David Barentine this. I said, Brother, I'm going to tell you something. I said, I can stay here. He, he pastored this church for 32 years. He started it and pastored it for 32 years. And then they went six months without a pastor. I came. And, uh, and I've been here ever since, obviously. And I told him, I said, but Brother, I said, there's one thing for sure. And he said, what's that? I was picking on him. I said, I can stay here 32 years and I could retire. I said, but. I still won't be as old as you are when you retire. And uh, so I always picked on him about that because he, uh, uh, he was a great teacher of the word. And if, you, if you ever sat under his preaching and had the privilege of doing that, it was, he, he was a blessing. Amen. And he was a good teacher, good teacher. And uh, he and I had some good discussions, went to preacher fellowships, that kind of thing. He attended church here until he moved off back up to Aliceville, Alabama, where he's from. And, uh, and so then, but he's with the Lord now. And, um, and so it's just me. Amen. A lot of times on homecoming, you get the, the former pastors. Well, I can't get ours. It only been one and he's not around anymore. And, uh, and so, and, um, we just have to get, uh, you had to just stuck with me. What can I say? And, uh, that's all I know to tell you. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God to bless us to, uh, tonight and ask God to bless the offerings we give tonight. I'm going to give Brother Jason Creamer, Brother, ask you to bless it. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another opportunity to be back in your house tonight. Dear Lord, we pray for each and every family that's represented here. Dear Lord, we, we pray for those that are unable to be here tonight, whether it be sickness or indifference. Dear Lord, you know their heart. We pray that you just touch them where they are, dear Lord, and bless them. And we pray for this offering, dear Lord. We pray that you just take it and multiply it. And we pray for our missionaries across the world, dear Lord. 
We pray for the upcoming missionary trip that you just bless it and keep everybody safe as they travel, dear Lord. And we ask these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. 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 Let's all stand together and turn your pages to 493. It is well with my soul, 493.
know, sometimes we sing these songs and we don't know what we're singing, amen. And uh, these hymns, remember uh, what a hymn is. A hymn is scri not scripture that so much put the music, but things about scripture that's put the music. And I love the hymns. You can't outdo the hymns. There's nothing out there. I, now, I'm a, now, let me tell you how, where I'm coming from. I am a Southern gospel fanatic. I love Southern gospel music. I mean, my favorite group out there, I think everybody knows that, is Gold City. I mean, it's just, I don't think you come any better than Gold City. Now, I've liked, I liked Brother Harlan Burton, a dear friend of mine from Daveville, Alabama. Love him. Love his singing. Love his songs. Love Southern gospel. But as much as I love Southern gospel, and, and, and a lot of times Southern gospel, they resurrect the hymns too a lot of times. They sing them too. And, uh, but nothing beats the hymns, I'm telling you. It's just, it's just there. And um, uh, just think about this third verse. And, and, and I, the reason I jump on these third verses is because a lot of times the third verse is left out in Baptist churches. Every Baptist church I've ever been in, they sing the first, second, and last. Then they don't sing the third. The third one just gets dropped somehow or another. Now, we started singing all of them, Brother Tommy Rigsby. Many of you, some of you didn't know Brother Tommy. Brother Tommy was been a deacon in our church. He, I guess he was Sunday school superintendent for years. And, and uh, I guess he's done about everything in a church you can do in a church. And he, he was a blessing. Amen. Miss him. He with the Lord having a good old time. Amen. I'm sure. He's probably up there telling Coca-Cola stories. And uh, that's probably what he's doing. But anyway, he says, uh, I don't know why we just sing first, second, last. He won't sing them all. He said, they're all good. Now, if you knew something about Brother Tommy, I ain't, I'm just, I ain't picking on a man. I loved him. I loved him like a daddy. I did. I loved that man. He couldn't carry a tune in the bucket. The bucket was tuned up. I mean, if the bucket was tuned up and sung for him, he couldn't sing, man. I'm telling you. But he loved him. He loved the hymns. And, uh, and so this third verse, listen to it. It says, My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My, now, here's what I mentioned this morning. My sin... Not in part, but the whole Amen. is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Amen. Now listen, I mean, you can't beat that. Amen. As my mama would say, with a stick. Amen. Now I'll tell you what she could beat with a stick, me. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I got whipped with anything my mama could get a hold of. You know, and uh, nowadays I'm not sure what they'd call that, but... Uh, I, 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 I say thank you, amen. I say thank you. Take your Bibles, if you will, tonight. Hope that you have them. If you don't, there should be one close to you. Turn over to the book of 2 Chronicles, if you will, for, with me tonight. Um, again, you know, just to go over some things with you. Um, you, know, you know, Sunday nights, if you'll notice, I'm a little bit different than I am on Sunday mornings. Wednesday nights, a whole lot different than it is on uh, Sunday mornings or Sunday night. And uh, Wednesday night we get more into the intricate part of a psalm, a book, or whatever. I love book studies. Now, I think y'all been coming here long enough now. I love book studies. I, 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 I'm, the, I'm not the sharpest pencil in the box, so I got to look at it from my perspective of how I can learn. And what I have to do is uh, tell me what it's about. If you can tell me what it's about, just like uh, I guess this is true of any man, but tell me how it works. Tell me what it does. Okay, like if I'm, or tell me what it does. So if I have a piece of equipment and I know what that piece of equipment does and then I know what that machine's doing, then I have a better understanding if something goes wrong with it, what needs to happen. You know what I mean? So I go from the whole to the part. I can't understand the part until I understand what it's all about. You, you, got, you got to just talk to me that in plain English, okay? So that's the reason, one of the reasons I like to study books and to study chapters. And uh, that's the reason I go back and tell you history of things is because of the fact is that's just that's as much for my benefit as it is yours. And, uh, but uh, again, you know, I want to learn everything there that God has for us, but I don't want to get so bogged down that people get lost in it too. That's, that, that's a fine line when you're preaching to such a broad audience, okay? And uh, you know, you, you're trying to bring a lot of people along with different ways. We have Facebook Live. I appreciate the guys in there that, uh, that uh, we uh, listen to us. I know we got some new ones here lately of listening to us on Facebook. And I mentioned to you, uh, and I hope he's listening tonight, um, David Brantley. Uh, he had a, 
I said a light stroke. That's what his wife said. But now they don't know for sure that's what happened. They, uh, but you know, something happened, obviously, and uh, there's no bleeding there. But he's got to follow up with the doctor this week, so we need to pray for him. And uh, we certainly want to be in prayer for all the others that we mentioned uh, on Wednesday night, of course, and on course of Sunday. I want to use Second Chronicles chapter five, verse fourteen, as a little springboard text uh, tonight. Uh, as I get back last week or uh, last Sunday, I preached to you a message about the pattern of uh, God's pattern and talked about God is a God of order. Remember that? God is a God of order. Uh, everything has order. He created uh, the world. It's got order. He created government. It's got order. He created the, the home. It's got order. He created the church. It's got order. Everything that's got order, it, it, God created has order. And God himself is a God of order. And, uh, and the Bible is orderly. It, it, you know, everything, if, you know, if it doesn't make sense, then it's probably not true. Same thing with the, uh, theology. Remember what theology is. Theology is what man says about God. It's man's thoughts about God. Bibliology is inspired, what the Bible says. Theology is not necessarily inspired. It's amazing to me how many people or how many preachers even will go to a commentary and quote a commentary as if it's just like the Bible. And that's just not the way it is. That's a man's opinion. And, uh, and so, you know, you got good people out there. You can take their opinions and it's, it's well meant and well received. Others are not. But God is a God of order. And so I want to continue on with that tonight and, talk, and continue to talk about this God, a God of order. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse number 14, look at your Bibles. The Bible says there, So that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. Now I want to focus on that last phrase of that verse where it says, For the glory of the Lord had filled the house. And this is obviously after the tabernacle and, and, uh, and it had, then God said, okay, I'm going to come into the house and, he, and, and the Shekinah glory, which is sort of, I guess you can look at it as the smoke, you know, like a cloud, a smoke cloud, a vapor cloud, whatever how it is. I wasn't there and didn't see it. But uh, the Bible says, by, it, it says there, by reason of the cloud and uh, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. Now, John 4, 24 in the, in, in, in the Gospels gives us a little bit of insight into God. Now, back in the Old Testament, God, the, God wanted to do what? When, when the children of Israel were taken out of bondage in Egypt and led across the desert, God, first of all, He uh, erected and told them how to erect and build and, how, and, and what materials to use uh, intricately and very detailed about the tabernacle. Why was the tabernacle so important? And why was the tabernacle in the center of where the 12 tribes would encamp around it? Because God wanted to dwell in the midst of His people. That was the whole thing. God wants to dwell with His people. And then later on, the tabernacle went away. The temple came into, into effect. And then the Old Testament, the Old Covenant uh, was, was satisfied and fulfilled. And now we have the New Covenant to where, what's the temple now? Somebody tell me, church. Yeah, us. Us. Our bodies, our heart. Not, not our red corpuscle thing that beats blood, but the seed of our being, who we are. You know, it, now the Holy Spirit uh, doesn't dwell in buildings or tabernacles. Now it dwells in us. We're the temple of God. And, uh, and so that's the new covenant. And uh, so once the tabernacle was erected, divine order was achieved and everything was in its place to every piece of furniture. And now, we, I, now I've had preacher friends of mine that have gone to the uh, in detail, detail of building a, a, a tabernacle and I've seen it. Now I, God's never led me to do that. <laughs> I'll leave that to somebody else. Matter of fact, how many of you remember uh, Brother uh, Michael Todd? Does that name sound familiar? He, he's the one that had the ark up here. Remember him? He's the one that came and brought the, 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 uh, a replica uh, of, of, of an ark that he himself built. Well, he has one of the tabernacle too that he does. Matter of fact, he has one that he dressed in the high priestly robe. He tells you all about the robe, tells you all about the tabernacle, and he does that. By the way, just to give you all some, this is, a, this is an infomercial. He will be with us one Sunday in June, but he's not doing the tabernacle. 
I, have, I, haven't, I haven't asked him to do the tabernacle. What he's going to be speaking on is the end times. That's what he's going to be speaking on on that Sunday morning and Sunday night. He'll be here with us in one week in June, okay? And uh, I'm not sure which one that is, Brother Jeremy. It might be one of the two y'all gone. I'm not sure. And, um, but anyway, uh, we're going to have a good time with Brother Michael Todd, okay? And uh, it's hard to get him. He's very, very busy. Go over to the book of Exodus, if you will. Let me lay this down here. And uh, I'm not giving you, I'm giving you, I guess, a lot of details, but I'm, I got one thought that I want to talk about. And this is the presence of God. If we want God's presence in our hearts, in our lives, in our church, in our ministry, then we've got to be a, God, a, a people of order and follow God's order specifically, okay? We can't be disrespectful and expect God to come in. If you go back to the Old Testament, one thing I find that the people back then and God demanded it was reverence. And one of the things that we're missing in our churches today is reverence. We need to get back to realize that God is a God of order and a God of holiness and a God that, that, that deserves the utmost respect that we could ever give Him. Amen. How many of you agree? Say amen. And uh, so in Exodus 40, look over there if you will. And uh, let's read uh, uh, verses uh, 34 and 35. The Bible says, Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now, we go over and over again and, and uh, just go over to the book of Isaiah and we're going we're gonna to move uh, again in, in, in the Bible a little bit tonight. And uh, Isaiah 42, look with me, verse 8. I had, I had a friend of mine one time came and, uh, and I was preaching one Sunday morning and he left and the only thing he could say about my preaching, never heard me preach before in his life and he's still a dear friend of mine. And he told me, I believe he gave me one of the greatest compliments a preacher could have. And I said, and he says, I'm going to tell you something. He said, you use more scripture than any preacher I've seen in my life. I said, well, amen. Amen. I'm not here to tell you what I got, what I think much. I'm telling you, I tell you what God says. Amen. You can't pre to preach what God says unless you read the Bible. I don't know any other way of doing it. Okay. And, and uh, Isaiah 42, look with me in verse 8. The Bible says, I am the Lord... That is my name. Now remember the little thing I told you about the King James Version. In verse number 8 there, it says, I am the Lord. If you're looking at your King James Bible there, Lord's all capitalized, right? Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. What's the significance of that? Huh? Yahweh. That's the name Yahweh. That's the sacred tetragram in the, in the, in the Hebrew. That is the four consonants that make up the, uh, the name of God, Yahweh. First... And uh, God named himself in Exodus 3, verse 14. He told, the people, told Moses, when you go tell the people of Israel that Yahweh, the I am, that I am has sent thee. And uh, it's all capitalized. He says there in 42, verse 8, I am the Lord, that is my name. And my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. I tell you what, the church of God today would really do well to take notice of that verse in, in Isaiah 42, verse number 8. Because of the fact is, we erect a lot of things, and we, we love to hear a lot of things. Uh, let me give you an il illustration of what I'm saying about that. Um, and I use this illustration, and the only illustration I know are personal. So um, I was very involved in the Ten Commandments issue when it hit Alabama down in, in Capitol. I was down there for three weeks every day. Uh, pretty much all day. And, um, you know, not, during the day wasn't much going on, just people coming and going and all that kind of stuff. And, and people want to sing hymns. It's sad. I learned a lot of things. There were people down there that didn't know the words to the hymns and, uh, because they don't sing them anymore. And it's a shame. I, I, I found that uh, uh, kind of bothering. Um, and then in the evenings is when things got cranked up. Uh, you know, they would bring preachers in to preach and different people in to sing and, all that kind of stuff. And you get somebody in to sing a song and, you know, they'd do all right. Well, this one group from North Alabama, I don't know if it's still there or not, but they had a girl's home and they brought in a bunch of girls that were dressed in solid black. 
I mean, had black top, black pants, black everything. They were looked me like gothic, really gothic. And uh, well, antennas were going up, you know, about all that got to stuff. And then they, when they when they got up there, I don't know, about twenty five, thirty of them out there, and and uh, down in front of the crowd, big crowd there. Matter of fact, that was the night James Dobson was down there. I, I remember it. I was there. I was sitting right down in the crowd, and um, I, I, matter of fact, I was very involved in it. And uh, and these girls down there, and they all got in these um, kind of weird positions, you know, like you know, like they were doing ballet, but it wasn't ballet. And um, that was my first introduction to worship dancing. I, I, I mean, I, I never. I said, "What in the world are they doing?" I mean, it, then they started playing a song over the loudspeakers, and then them girls started doing these these moves in unison, and boy. You know, and then they had, then one guy stepped out of the crowd. There was a guy in there, too, some guys in there too, a couple. He went to the microphone and started screaming something. I don't know what he was screaming. I guess he was singing, but I don't know what he was singing. I couldn't make it out. And the crowd went crazy. I'm talking about, hey, woo. Like I'm saying, wait a minute here. Something's wrong. God said, I'm not going to share my glory with anybody else. Neither praise to graven images. And that includes people. God is worthy to be praised. God deserves our glory. And what we do, we do to glorify Him. That's what worship is. And let me define it for us again. Just as a church so we don't forget it. So that we ever remember it. When we meet together in the church, you don't come to impress anybody. Anybody else. You don't come to see everybody else. You don't come to hear somebody particular sing or somebody particular play, even though they all do a good job. You don't come to hear somebody speak or preach. You come in the presence of one. You're not in the presence of the congregation. You're in the presence of one, and that's God. And we're here to give Him glory and here to give Him praise. And we do that orderly. Amen. And we do that because we ask when we meet together, what? That God will meet with us. Don't we? The Bible says where two or three are gathered. Get it now. The church misrepresents that today. Well, the Bible says where two or three are gathered, we're in the midst. There you go, brother. You got to get all the words in there. Where two or three are gathered together in my name. I love it, don't you? I just love that. That's good stuff right there. You know it. And uh, he, he says, and uh, that is my name. And then he says, and my glory will I not give to another. And my praise, neither my praise to graven images. And in America, we've changed so much and gotten so far away from what, who God is and what God is and what we intend to do in worship that people don't know anymore. And that's the reason it's places like us that have to. And I believe that God never leaves himself without a witness. And I'm not the only witness. we got a lot of good preachers out there, a lot better than me. And... Um, and, and, I, and I, I'm saying, thank you, God. I don't have no Elijah mentality. I don't have that thing, and I'm the only one that's gotten away, Lord. I'm the only one telling it. No, there's a lot of churches out there telling the truth. There are a lot of preachers out there proclaiming the truth. And, you know, God's not going to leave himself without a witness. Amen? And we got to tell people how it was. Jeremiah, the prophet, put it this way in chapter 2 and verse 11, where he says, Hath a nation changed their gods? which are yet no gods. But my people, my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. And I'm afraid today that in our modern churches that many have exchanged the, their glory for that which doth not profit. It sounds good, but it's the difference between eating a bologna sandwich and eating a ribeye steak. I'm telling you. 
You know, I like bologna now. Don't get me wrong. I like it fried. Amen, Brother Scott. Now, I'm going to put a craving on you. Y'all going to go back and get a bologna and lettuce and tomato sandwich. Amen. Put some mayonnaise on it. Amen. Slap between two pieces of bread. Get back out of the way. Amen. I like it. But I'll tell you one thing. It don't stay with you like a ribeye does, though. Amen. You eat a ribeye, it'll stick in there. And I'm going to tell you, like going to some of these churches, they have a sermonette for the Christianettes. They don't want to offend anybody. They don't want to tell anything because they don't know anything. And uh, they, they shortchange their people and don't want to teach them. You know, let me tell you something. It's the difference between going and getting a drink, you know, eating a bologna sandwich and a ribeye sandwich. I'm telling you. You said a sandwich? Yes, a steak sandwich. Y'all try one one time. It's pretty good. You get a good, good piece of ribeye, put it between two pieces of bread, put some A1 sauce on it, and, uh, whoo! Huh? Yeah, they do. I've had it, too. Sure enough, do. That's good stuff. Amen. But here's my statement I want to give to you tonight. We cannot expect to it be admitted into the presence of God with an attitude of disrespect. If we want to come together as a church and want to be used together as a church, and don't get me wrong, we, God's doing more with this church right now on May the 1st of 2022 than He's done in 60 years. And that ain't because of me. It's in spite of me. I tell you that. I stand amazed at what God does because I'm nothing. I'm just a speck of dirt. And I'm just, I, I'm just, I, I get up every day thanking God for an opportunity to serve Him somewhere. Do something for Him. Amen. I'm just a country boy out of sticks in North Carolina that God took and said, I want you to do this. And I argued all the way to Tennessee Temple. And I felt I was the loneliest person in the world when I was dropped off on the corner of 12th and Hawthorne that day going up into a dormitory. I was one of the loneliest people in the world. Because I had one suitcase in my hand and a pillow under the other arm. That's all I had in the world. And I went to the dorm, and I stayed there in that dorm. That was a lonely dorm. And uh, by myself, first day or so, then my roommate got there, and it got bad then. Amen. I'm glad one of them moved out. And uh, then I, left, I was left with one, and uh, he left about, the second, about after the first semester. So I had the second semester of room all by myself. God took care of me. Amen. But in God's presence, there's provision. Now, you need to write this down. It's good stuff. Not because I said it, just because it's true. But in God's presence, there's provision. In God's presence, there's guidance. He's going to guide you. In God's presence, there's healing. God's going to take care of you. God's going to make it okay. It may not be the way we think he, it is that he's going to make it okay, but God's going to make it okay. A lot of times when we pray, a lot of times we pray for the wrong thing. The Bible says if we pray according to his will, we know that he heareth us. And if we know that he heareth us, we know that we shall have what so we ask. But as a caveat to that when it says if we pray according to his will. Sometimes it's not God's will, just like Paul he had a thorn in the flesh, and he asked God three times to remove it. And each time, God said, my grace is sufficient. Sometimes people have to live with stuff, and God's grace is sufficient. Amen? It take us, it'd be good if we just learn that song, It Is Well With Our Soul. Whatever we have, whatever cross God called us to bear, and I'll never forget, was it Tony Snow? Was that, the word, was that uh, Bush's, uh, um, was that him? Thank you, brother. Uh, that was his press conference secretary guy, wasn't it? And he had cancer. He died of cancer. Remember that? Uh, he, and, and I remember him being interviewed about his cancer and said he'd done send it up to the highest rank, being next to the president every day. And he says, don't you feel? And he was a young man. What was it, in his 40s? Something like that? 30s, 40s? And he died. He said, don't you feel, you know, don't you have, don't have bitterness about you going to be, you know, you're going to be passing so early? He said, No. He says, God's given me a cross to bear. 
And he says, and I just pray that in the eyes of a nation that I can bear that cross well for my Lord. He learned that song, It Is Well With My Soul. He knew whatever it was, God had given him the grace to go through whatever it was. There's grace in dying too. I've been at the bedside of many, many folks who have been out into eternity and I've watched them and heard them take their last breath. And even though I don't understand everything, I know that that person who knew God so well and loved Him so much was carried by the arms of angels into the presence of Almighty God. And I'm thinking to myself, man, what grace is that to be carried home? If they wouldn't come back, they could. As much as they love us, as much as they miss us, and I don't even, I'm not even sure they're missing us. I think they're having such a good time up there. I'll tell you what, when I get there, I ain't coming back. Don't look for me. Because if I get there, I'm, I'm staying. Amen. I ain't coming back down here. I mean, as much as I miss everybody, I'm going to say, I'm done. I'm going to put my feet up and get ready. Amen. I'm going to watch the Lord put all these liberals in their place one day. Amen. That's right. Woo! There's healing. Then number four, there's protection. God protects us. I'm a firm believer that God takes care of people like me. He takes care of fools. No enemy could stand before Israel if God didn't want them to. And folks, I don't worry about Israel. People say, well, look at the United States making negotiations through Russia with Iran to get nuclear weapons so that we can get more oil. And they say, if they get it, they're going to attack Israel. They're going to attack Israel. They worried about, I'm not worried about Israel. And you say, well, you, you, you just don't, you're indifferent? No, God got them. I, God's got it. God's going to take care of it. Let me tell you, this is how much I believe in God. Iran can get all the nuclear capability they want and build as many bombs as they want. It's not going to bomb Israel. Not, God's going to protect them. You hear me? Now, you talk about the Iron Dome all you want. They got God Dome. And that supersedes any other dome. Okay? Amen? No, no enemy can stand against God. But if we can't, again, I want to go back to my premise statement now. We cannot expect to be admitted into the presence of God with an attitude of disrespect. And that leads me to two men. And I want you to take your Bibles and go over with me to the book of Leviticus chapter 10. If you know anything about your Bibles, when you get over there in Leviticus, you get into the priesthood, you get into all the details that God uh, gave to the nation of Israel through the priest to do the tabernacle, to do all this. And you had two guys out there by the name of Nadab and Abihu. Now, I've mentioned these two guys before. They were rascals. They were the sons of Aaron. Chapter 10 of Leviticus, chapter, verse 1, the Bible says, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon. And the Bible says, And offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. Now, everything before was laid out. Go back to the God of order. God laid it all out. God told them what to do. God told them how to do it. He gave them A, B, C, D. And it's just like the world we live in now. I, you know, I, when I went to seminary and I went to college, I was taught by guys that most of them not here anymore. I got, one, I got two professors, and one of them was real young when he came in. I only took one class with him. But the professor that's left on this earth now that I had the most classes with, all the rest of them did, he's 96. So that gives you an idea of how old the guys were that taught me in seminary and college. They had already been there and done that. Started churches, started schools, teaching, doing all that kind of stuff. They were in their 70s, you know, 70s when teaching me. And, um, and you, know, and they, you know what they taught me to do? They taught, and I don't do it as I should, but I try to do it as much as I, 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 you know, I can and to remember to do it and can do it with my limited intelligence to be exact when you're talking about God. 
But nowadays we live in a world, just, we live in a world of hand grenades and horseshoes. Well, it don't, it don't matter how you do it. Just do it. Why well, beg the difference? It does matter how you do it. Because, see, God has it all laid out. He's a God of order. Amen? He told Aaron and his sons, his descendants, okay, when you go into there and administer the priesthood, this is how you do it. Well, Nadab and Abihu, they said, we're going to do it the way we want to. Not the way God said to do it. Now, what did we learn this morning in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4? That sin is the transgression of the law. Right? Isn't that what 1 John 3 verse 4 said this morning? Now, wh who wrote the law? God. So sin is whatever God says it is. Amen? Y'all with me? These two guys offered strange fire. And look at verse 2. And, the, and there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them that they died before the Lord. Now I got news for you, church. Listen to me. If God still did in the new covenant what He did back under the old covenant, there wouldn't be many of us left. I'm telling you. Brother Rick, be very few. I'd probably be gone too. I ain't, I'm not going to say I'm better than anybody. I'd probably be gone too. Because how many, how many, let me ask you a personal question tonight. Think about it. How many of you know what God says, but you chose to do it your way anyway because you thought your way was the best way and you did it your way? How many of you raise your hand? See, we all gone. See, that's where we come into that word that's the most misunderstood word in the church. I don't have a grasp on it, grip on it. You don't. No theologian has. No songwriter does. The closest comes John Newton who wrote Amazing Grace. The most misunderstood doctrine of the church is grace. I'm thankful, Brother Mike, I get up every day and have the grace of God. Because I need it. You know why? Because I'm a sinner. I mess up all the time. If God, if God treated us like we treat Him, we'd never be able to get His presence. We'd never be blessed. But God doesn't treat you the way you treat Him and the way I treat Him. So in other words, what I'm trying to tell us, church, I know it's been a rough day on us, but the Word of God's true. Amen? Let God be true and every man be a liar. We're no good. And we need Jesus. And God is a God of order. And if we want presence of God, then we've got to do it God's way and come into it with a respectful attitude in our minds. Makes me sick today the way churches act and the way preachers act. and they got a pecking order and all that kind of stuff and going on. But these two guys right here, they show disrespect for what God said. I remember one time, how many of you ever been pulled over by a patrolman? Let's go ahead and see the show of you know, Miss Angel, I know you have. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to raise both of mine. I was getting so many tickets one time, my wife said she wasn't paying no more. I mean, I was getting them all the time. And uh, especially when I live in Chattanooga. And, um, but I remember one time I was going down this road and I come up to a, a fork and I, and, and, and I was, I traveled this thing a lot. It was a fork that came into a, uh, you know, like a Y that really came into another road. And for a long time, as I can remember, it was a yield sign. Now, I know what a yield sign is. You yield to oncoming traffic. Well, there was no oncoming traffic. So I just zoom right on through the yield sign. Well, to my knowledge, uh, without my knowledge, Brother David, they changed that yield sign to a stop sign. Yeah, uh-oh. And it's sort of out in the country. And I said, I didn't know it was a stop sign. I thought it was a yield sign. Well, the next thing I saw was blue lights. And I'm sitting there wondering, well, what did I do? So I pull over, and this uh, 
patrolman came up, came up to me and knocked on the window. And he says, I need your driver's license and insurance. So I took it out and he looked at him. He says, um, I'll be back in a minute. I like the way they do that. That, that way, that, you know, they make you sweat, and, you know, get nervous. Well, what, what, what did I do? I still don't know what I did. And so I'm thinking I wasn't speeding. And, uh, you know, maybe I didn't use a turn signal. Maybe I, I, that's what I came up with. I said I didn't use a turn signal, maybe. I don't know. And so he went back, stayed. I know he ran my license and, and, uh, and all that kind of stuff. And he came back and uh, I said, uh, I got a question. And he says, okay, what's your question? I said, what did I do? He says, you ran that stop sign back there. I said, that ain't no stop sign back there. I said, that's a yield sign back there. And he says, get out of the car and go back down and look at it. So I did. I got out of the car. And it wasn't, I don't know, probably about to hear down to the road down there. And I, 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 I went there and I was, show, show enough, it was a stop sign. I went back, I, I said, when did they put that there? <laughs> I did. And he, and he says, well, the reason I pulled you over, he says, is because I'm sitting here and you ran that stop sign right in front of me. And I'm saying, that man's crazy. Run a stop sign right in the presence of a cop. I said, I didn't know it was a stop sign back there. I said, it was a yield sign. He says, you're right. It was a yield sign, and they just recently, in the last couple of weeks, changed it to a stop sign. He saw that I had on, on, a, a, a shirt on, like military. He thought I was military, and I said, no, I'm not military. I said, uh, I wish the world, but I'm not. And I said, uh, look, God called me to Bible college and not the military and, and all that kind of stuff. He says, look, he says, just pay attention to the signs from now on. I said, well, I thought. I said, I saw a yield sign. And uh, he said, it's a stop sign. And, and let me tell you this. It stayed a stop sign for a long time. And Brother David, now they done changed it back to a yield sign. I wish they'd make up their mind because when they put it back as a stop sign, I'm going to run it again. You know, if I ever go back that way, okay? And, uh, but anyway, that's just, a, that's just an example because here it is right in that, uh, God's face. You got these two guys that are just telling when God says do something, they can right in God's face do something else. Isn't that a slap in God's face? Isn't that a slap in God's face? Isn't that disrespect? The Bible says in Galatians chapter 6, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. God's not going to be mocked. We live in a world today where a lot of things are being done and God's presence is not there. Jeremiah, you read Jeremiah. Jeremiah the prophet, and I'm, now I'm, summar, I'm summarizing and paraphrasing, okay? Jeremiah was a prophet to the, prophet, to the nation of Judah and he says there will come a day when people will say, Thus saith the Lord. When the Lord did not say so. And boy, we're there now. Take your Bibles, go to Hebrews chapter 13, if you will. Hebrews chapter 13, we're almost there, okay? Just hang on with me, okay? I'm having a good time right now, just hang on. Hebrews chapter 13, appreciate your attention. Verse number 9, watch this right here. I believe the Apostle Paul, who wrote the book of Hebrews, he tells us at the end of this book, now, Hebrews is a predominantly Old Testament uh, application book. It uses a lot of the Old Testament scriptures. It goes back and uses a lot of the types of the Old Testament. And at the end of this book, in verse 9, after he tells us in verse 8 that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, in verse 9, he says, Be not carried away about with divers and strange doctrines. You say, where you go? What, what are you talking about? Adab and Abihu offered strange fire. You know, I often wonder why God allows these people to get on TV and taunt this crazy stuff, leading people astray, and sending, I believe leading a lot of people to hell. 
Why does God allow that? Grace. Grace. See, we don't understand it. We don't have our eyes on it. We don't have our minds wrapped around it. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Now, he's talking about go back and the offerings and all that kind of stuff. He just, he's applying it to all that. But, uh, the, you know, don't offer strange doctrines. And, 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 and church, we live in such an electronic world now where you can get on the Internet and listen to anything you want to. And there are a lot of strange doctrines out there. There's a song out there, and I mentioned this song not too long ago by Russ Taft talked about the trumpet of Jesus. And he says, I'm listening to the trumpet of Jesus while the world is listening to a different sound. I'm listening for the trumpet of Jesus. But unfortunately, not only the world, but many of God's church is listening to a different sound. You ever heard something just didn't sound right? You didn't know why, but it just didn't sound right? There's a lot going on today just don't sound right. And there's nothing wrong, even in the world that says it's okay, of saying, look, I'm going to check that out to make sure according to the Bible it meets the test. Try the spirits whether they be of God. Because if we want to go into the presence of God, we can't go into the presence of God with disrespect. Because God is a God of order. He's a God of... He tells us what He wants to do. He told us what He said, and He meant what He said. And that's the way it's going to be. There's a pattern. you got divine order, you got God's revealed glory, and you got judgment. For irreverence. Look at your Bible. I'm not just telling you something. I'm not making it up. It's facts. It's there. You know, the reason I stick to the Bible because I'm scared. Not, I, I, I don't want to do anything else, but I'd be scared to do anything else. See, I don't have to answer. You know, people say, well, you got to answer to a church. You got to answer this. You know, no, I got to answer to God. And that's bigger than anybody else in this building. Amen. And, uh, and I'm thankful that God doesn't take care of things down here, he, he, you know, like he did in the Old Testament. Because like I said, there'd be a lot of us wouldn't be here if God just didn't show grace. Thank God for his grace. Let's bow our heads tonight. His heads are bowed and eyes are closed. We can't expect to go into the presence of God with an attitude of disrespect. God's a God of order. He's a God of revealed glory. And he's in a judgment for irreverence. We went to the tabernacle, went to the temple, and went to the body. And, uh, you know, now God leads, he, he lives in us. We ought not take God somewhere we don't want God to be. I ought not be involved in something we don't want God involved in. Amen. Maybe you're here tonight and you say, well, preacher, God's spoken to me tonight. I don't, I, I'm, a, I'm saved. I know if I die, I go to heaven. <clears throat> but God's spoken to me tonight. I want God's presence in my life. But I know there's some things I need change for that to take place the way it ought to. You say, preacher, won't you pray for me? Would you slip your hand up where you are to slip it up? God bless you. I see several hands. Let's stay on our feet, if you will. I think the hymn of invitation is 366. I surrender all. Last thing I talked about, the five alls this morning was service. We need to give to God of service. Give life my soul, my life, my all. Maybe you had not done that. Those of you going on this mission trip, maybe you ought to let God say this. Hey, God, I want you to work in my heart. And if the mission feels where you want me, then that's where I want to go. You just lead, you lead me. If she plays, you come. The altar's open, you come on. You want to come down here and pray and get along with God tonight, you do that. Come on. As we pray tonight, amen. That's right. Come on. Just, just step out come on.
field tonight. Get Brother Josh, if you will, brother, to come. And uh, he's going to dismiss us in prayer tonight. Be sure to, uh, if you're going on that mission trip, meet Brother Jeremy over here tonight. Okay? Got some important things for y'all, Lord. Getting close. Amen? Getting close. Let's pray. Well, God, we thank you for another opportunity to be in your house again tonight, Lord. We thank you for the preaching of the word that we heard today. And, Lord, just thank you for, for meeting with us and just giving us that desire to live our lives, Lord, according to your will. Lord, we lift up our missionaries to you as they continue to do your work around the, the world, Lord. We specific, uh, specifically lift up Brother Mitch and the, the work that he's doing in Thailand and Mongolia, Lord. Just uh, that you'd bless him and have your hand upon him. We ask that you'd be with each and every one of us as we go our uh, separate ways this week, Lord. Just give us an opportunity and a chance to serve you. Keep us safe and bring us back here once again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.